We all want a business like Netflix or Amazon Prime. Businesses where once a customer engages with them, it becomes automatic and a part of their lifestyle from then on. But how do you build that forever transaction? I'm Robbie Kelman Baxter, and I have been studying subscription and membership models for nearly 20 years. In this podcast, my guests and I share the secrets and strategies of the membership economy. Join us for subscription stories, true tales from the trenches. We've spoken before on the show about the importance of customer experience in driving growth with guests like Wharton's Peter Fader, Gainsight's Nick Mehta, and Bain and Company's Stu Berman. But today's guest said you need to think beyond the customer. If you really want to accelerate growth, you need to focus on the employee experience. Tiffany Bova is the global growth evangelist at Salesforce. She's also the author of the Wall Street Journal best-selling book, Growth IQ, Get Smarter About the Choices That Will Make or Break Your Business. Tiffany has been named to the latest Thinkers 50 list of the world's top management thinkers and is a welcomed guest on Bloomberg, CNN, Cheddar, MSNBC, and Yahoo Finance, among others. In our conversation, we talk about whether your growth IQ is something you're born with or something you build, the 10 paths to growth, and how software as a service has changed what it takes to thrive in sales. Tiffany, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you. Oh, thank you for having me, Robbie. So I wanted to start by asking you, you're a global growth evangelist. What is that? And what do you do all day? I am an external evangelist for sharing thought leadership and trends in the market on behalf of Salesforce, but also to help advise our existing customers and sort of the broader shareholder community on what trends we think is going to be impacting their business in the future as it relates to things like growth and innovation. So you wrote a book on Growth IQ. Question on that, is your Growth IQ something that you're born with or is it something that you can develop? So that's an interesting one. I don't know if anybody's ever asked me that before. So I'll approach it this way. It was, to me, growth is a thinking game. And so it's about outthinking your competition, especially if you're a small business, you're never going to be able to outspend a large enterprise, right? A global fortune 500 company. You're never going to have as many salespeople or as deep of pockets or as robust of an innovation pipeline. So how do you win? If you're in one category against a very large organization, that's where that thinking mentality comes into play. It's what are the things you can do better than the competition? And to me, it is really about understanding the context of the market you're competing in, making decisions about where and how you think you have the ability to win in the market and doubling down there, but never ending at that point, right? It's this constant loop of evaluation and making sure you're staying in front of things. The book found 10 paths to growth, and I don't think there's any more than that. And you may go, well, what about this? And I loosely could probably tie it to one of the growth paths, I'm I'm fairly confident. But if not, then it's really disruptive, and I'd love to hear from you. But if it's one of those 10, those 10 were just modernized views on growth strategies that have been around for like, let's say 100 years. It's just now we have mobile, social, cloud, big data, and lots of changes in the way in which customers buy and we sell and subscription models and all of that, which is very different than it was 25, 30 years ago. There were subscription pockets, but not as prevalent as it is now. So I think it's just a way to reframe how you go about looking for top line revenue. And and that was the goal. So in terms of born with it, developed it, it sounds like you come out maybe more on the develop it side with these 10 paths being things that can be learned. Is that fair? Yeah. And I would say the born with it is, are you born curious? right? Are you born being willing to learn new things? Or do you have that fixed mindset, right? Do you have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? If you have a fixed mindset and you're like, this is the way I do it. It's the way I'm always going to do it. And regardless of what someone may tell me, I'm sort of committed. That isn't necessarily growth IQ, right? It's really about giving yourself a little space every single day to try things that might be uncomfortable and disruptive to the way you do things. But It's super important if you want to remain relevant and continue growing in light of everything we now have in front of us. It almost seems like you need a growth mindset if you want your company to enjoy rapid growth. 
Yes, absolutely. And the book Mindset by Carol Dweck is the great place to start, right? She just digs into growth and fixed mindset. And it wasn't the intention. I think the goal of it was I had was meeting with clients and they'd be, they'd say to me, Hey, listen, you know, look, I've been, been here, as I said, six and a half years, but prior to being at Salesforce, I was a research fellow at Gartner for a decade, helping companies transform the way they sell. But then in the 15 years before that, I was a practicing sales marketing and service leader uh, very, very early in this thing we call as a service business. I was a Loquist beta client. I was constant contacts beta client. Like I've been doing these cloud-based selling and recurring revenue model selling. I ran the largest web hosting company in the US 2000, 2004. We were three times, four times the size of Rackspace. We almost bought them. So I've been in this subscription game for a while, but I would say that I would often hear from clients when I was at Gartner was in quarter, we're finding it harder to grow. Should I hire more salespeople, spend more marketing dollars or cut costs? And you said this, Robbie, at the beginning, right? This sort of cutting costs to growth is a short-term strategy and not a good one. If you're small and you're strapped and you have to, I get it. But if you have the ability to not do that, I would advise you not to do it. But when I would hear those three things, I'd be like, in my mind, there has to be more ways. Can we go through the 10 paths? I feel like I left the audience hanging because there's like these 10 paths and we're not going to tell you what they are. Can we go through those quickly, what your 10 paths are? Sure. What I tried to do was, like I said, align to paths or growth strategies that were already in the market but needed a fresh lens because of what we now have available to us. So the first path was customer experience, which should be fairly self-explanatory. The second one is customer-based penetration, selling more to the existing base that you have, not ignoring them. The third is market acceleration, right? Accelerating into the market that you are currently in. Next was product expansion. Next was customer and product diversification. Now, if you're paying attention, that is the Ansoff matrix. Those four after customer experience were the matrix. And once again, modernized with a new twist on what we have available to us. The next was optimized sales. The next was churn, which was really homage to the subscription business. Next path eight was partnerships. Nine was coopetition. So working with companies that you may feel compete with you in some way. And the 10th path was unconventional strategies, which was really doing well by doing good and purpose over profit. I work at Salesforce. If you know anything about us, that should be no surprise that um, really trying to better in the world also helps companies have a greater growth opportunity. These are great. And these will be in the show notes so that you can you can refer to them. So for anybody who's like pulled over to the side of the road and is madly jotting these down, don't worry, easy to find. We'll go through some of them now. So how do you use these growth paths? Are, is it something that if you're working with, let's say, a startup or you're working with an organization that's, that's trying to expand into subscriptions, let's say, and they're looking at these, do you say just start at one and go through 10? Or is it look at these 10 as kind of a painter's palette and choose a couple to use and then don't use all 64 crayons in the crayon box because then you have a mess, use some restraint? Or how do you think about using these different tools when you're trying to drive growth, when you're thinking, do I hire more people? Do I throw money at it? Do I throw people at it? Or do I try to outthink my competition? Yeah, it's the latter. It is definitely not start at path one and it's a sequential order through the 10. And that really was the aha for the book. The aha for the book is not the 10 paths. Like once again, you should not be surprised by the 10 I outlined. But what the aha was, was number one, you start with the context. What is your business? Who are your customers? What are you selling? Why do you win? Why do you lose? What is your culture? Like really asking yourself those hard questions so you can understand what is your starting point, right? So like, I want to do the Ironman triathlon in the big island of Hawaii. Okay, I'm from Hawaii. So pick a Hawaii example. So I am not just going to show up for the Ironman and compete. Like I'd die. (laughs) I would probably die. But you have to start going like, okay, I I have to swim. I have to run. I have to bike ride. I cannot do it all at one time. I have to train in one and I might be really strong in one and not strong in the other. And I have to get to a place where I can do three really, really well. Think about it in that same way that once you understand the context, the next trick is understanding which growth paths you should do. And by the way, the one thing about growth is there's never one thing. It's never one growth path. You will always, always want to have customer experience for obvious reasons. You will always want to have 
customer base penetration, right? Taking care of the customers you have. And if you're in the subscription business, you're always want, going to want to pay attention to churn. So those three for me would be foundational for someone in subscription business, right? If that's the bottom layer, that's the foundation of your house, don't then try to put the roof on, right? You need to get those working and working well for you and then figure out, okay, based on the context, which one should I add next? And it's different for everybody. And so the book was each path has three stories. So there's 30 stories in the book, two positive use cases of the path, and then one cautionary tale of the path. So you can see how and when and why companies that you recognize, small brands, big brands, different industries, what they were doing in a point in time. The next thing, and really the thing that got me most excited, the finding that got me most excited was sequence. So context is first, combination of growth paths is second, and third is the sequence. The order in which you deploy those paths has meaningful and measurable impact to their success. And so, for example, if Netflix had started with streaming, would they have been successful? It's one of the stories in the book. My gut would say, of course not, because number one, we didn't have high-speed internet in our homes. Blockbuster had trained us that the VHS and DVD was the way we were going to watch movies. So they disrupted it the way we got our hands on that content, right? That we didn't have to drive anymore and it removed that friction. But they didn't start where the technology was not ready. Would they have been able to hang on or would they have burned through all their cash? So the order in which they did it, right? Start with mail order, go from DVD, start as high speed started to show up, right? Start to roll that out. But then when they left the US and went internationally, they went where there was already very strong connectivity in the homes. So they immediately jumped to streaming versus starting with DVDs. So that's what I mean by sequence, right? The order in which you do things. And so those three things are really what the growth IQ framework is all about. The paths are just the means to the end, right? But if you don't do the framework correctly, it doesn't matter which path you choose, uh, you're probably going to be disappointed with your results. That's really helpful. And I keep going back to this idea of an IQ. Can this be learned? It seems like you mapped it out in such a way. There are many organizations that don't have, where the people don't have growth mindsets, they have fixed mindsets. I do this. I've always... I run the fax machine. That's my job. As opposed to I manage a communication channel and today it's fax or yesterday it was fax and today it's TikTok or whatever my communication channel is. This idea that growth can be learned, that this framework in the proper sequence is a path to get there, or I don't want to say path because that's got a specific meaning in the book, but it's a road to get there. And that it starts with, as you said, understanding the customer, understanding the customer experience and starting in the right place. And then the next question I usually get is, okay, what's the right place? What's the right path? What's the right sequence? And early in my consulting analyst days, I used to answer that question very, very quickly. And I realized probably three or four years into my tenure, being a research fellow at Gartner was that I probably did a disservice, that the answer should have been, I don't know. Let's start with what do your customers say? What do people who have left you say from a customer standpoint? When you win, why do you win? Why do you lose? Like, what's your culture? And start to uncover the answer to those questions. And a lot of the time, unfortunately, a big majority of those questions are unanswered or they're a guess, or the executive team doesn't actually agree on the answer, which is why starting with context is so important. Because until you have a sort of buy-in and consistency across, okay, well, how do we even define customer experience? Start there. Like, what's the metric? What's the matter? Who's responsible? Like, start at the basics. Until you have those things nailed, how can you ever expect to have a disruptive strategy sort of introduced into your environment? Having definitions and having clarity around what you mean when you say our ideal customer, our goals, our metrics, to get really specific about what the priorities are, I think is something that many organizations gloss over because it's hard. It seems obvious and it's really hard. And it's actually quite painful when you're sitting around a room and everybody thinks they know who the customer is and each person shares that. And you're like, that's interesting. And that's good. Let's just say it's kind of all of those. It's sort of biggish, smallish. Yeah. And it's not personas. It's not what I'm talking about, right? Because you can get wrapped up. We have 64 personas, which I would say is probably 60 too many. But 
for another day. But I'm just going to give you an example. So as I said, I was running sales marketing and customer service for a web hosting company, clearly recurring revenue. We had a churn problem. We had a double digit churn problem. We saw it spike at the end of every month. And if we're sitting around the leadership table, it would be like, well, it's our products. They're not stable. You know, this is very early (laughs) in what we now take for granted. So just 2000 to 2004. So keep that in mind. So was it a product stability? You know, we had five nines uptime. That's where our SLA was like the big touting factor. Nobody even talks about that anymore. We've moved into a completely different direction, but it was SLA. So was it a product platform problem? Was it a call center agent problem? Was it a billing problem? And everyone, to your point, Robbie, had their opinion. So I said, okay, let's do this. I'm going to go and spend time on the call center floor. So that's what I did. And I came out of that and I went, I know what the problem is. Usually what ended up happening was people were forced canceled because their credit card expired. And so they weren't canceling, we were canceling them. And so once again, this is long before we had, back then the marketing technology stack was about a dozen. It's now over 9,000. So it was a dozen. It's still a problem though. I mean, passive churn It's amazing to me because that's almost like free money. Understand if you're losing customers because of a credit card problem, because of a payment problem, 70, 80% of the time, it's not because the customer has bad credit or is trying to commit fraud. It's because of some technical issue. And identifying that, first of all, great news, right? Because that's so much better than them saying, no, we just don't like your product, where you have a product problem, you have to go fix that. So, really interesting that. What was a problem 15 years ago, all of this new technology that's available to resolve that, and it's still an issue. That was the lesson, right? It was an internal system problem. So I just want you to think back, like what you just said, that back then, I then would have to pull a report whose credit card was going to expire in 60 days, create a campaign. There wasn't all these tools. There wasn't Salesforce. There wasn't Pardot. There wasn't Exact Target. There wasn't, you know, all the other things there was. It was Excel spreadsheets. And we loaded it up. And then we said, okay, here's the ones that are going to expire in 60 days. Let's create an email and send out to them. So we don't want your service to be interrupted. So we need you to update your credit card. So we cut the churn in half there. So that was kind of one fix, right? But all that was manual back then. So now to your point, Robbie, there's no excuse today. So easy. Pull a report automate the, have the note to the customer already pre-written, push it out 60 days in advance, do a reminder, do a reminder, do a reminder, 72 hours, 48 hours, 24 hours, you know what I mean? Maybe give them a week leeway, whatever you want to do without having to have humans do it. What an advantage, right? And so that's that in the book, I talk about looking at churn in an offensive way versus playing win back in a defensive way to now get them, get them to call you and give you the updated credit card instead of getting ahead of it. And that's just one example, but that requires you to go, okay, I don't know why I have high churn. What's happening? Digging into what it is. And by the way, I couldn't get the fixes in the system. I told the executive team what the problem was and I couldn't get them to sort of turn the corner. So I made them all sit in the call center for two hours. I don't think it was the end of their two hours. They were in my office. We need to fix these five things right away. I'm like, huh. Thank God. It's only been six months I've been asking you to fix it. So part of this is if your executives run the business from a spreadsheet, right? Or from a report or from the confines of their four walls, then you've got to get them where those pain points are happening, which is those moments that matter on a customer service call or in a chat or in the field with a field service. It's really kind of undercover boss for those of you in the US of what happens when executives get too far away from what's happening at the front lines. Yeah, I love that. We talk a lot about customer centricity on the Subscription Stories show, and this is such a perfect example of how you do it, right? You go to the call center and you listen. You determine what are the drivers of churn by listening to what people say when they cancel and looking at what they do when they cancel. What are they doing right before they cancel? I think that's really excellent. And it can be really hard as you point out, to move your organization to that kind of a culture, to a curious culture, to a growth-minded culture, to a customer-centric culture. I know you've spoken about pop-up teams as, as one tool for cultural change. Can you explain what that is and maybe talk a little bit about 
how you create the right kind of culture for growth. Yeah, that really pop-up team example came out of this term that I coined a number of years ago. It's probably been 15 years now, if not a little longer, called the seller's dilemma. And it was really a play on Clayton Christensen's innovator's dilemma, you know, and sort of homage to Clay. I have no problem sort of be like to Carol DeWick on mindset and fixed mindset. Same with seller's dilemma, like learn from the masters and sort of further the conversation down the road. But the seller's dilemma is how do I hit numbers today? while at the same time transforming for the future. And as a sales leader, that is this opposable mind. There's tension between the, if I don't hit my numbers today, I won't have a job. This is what I'm really good at, hitting numbers. I'm not very good at doing what we just said, right? Deconstructing the processes that are happening that may be holding my team and my people in other organizations, collaborative organizations from hitting their goals that this is this tension, this seller's dilemma of where do I spend my time? And you have to spend your time in both. There is no way to spend it in one or the other, but then it's how much time. And so the pop-up team was a way by which you could test transformation type activities without disrupting the revenue generation apple cart. So if you have a team of 50 sellers, grab three, carve them out, put them to the side and say, look, we're going to remove your productivity metrics. We're going to let you use the tools the way you use them. Door openers, we're going to learn from you kind of watching you in action and not giving them any constraints. And you may find that all of a sudden, they're far more free to use the tools you've deployed without your restrictions. So this kind of autonomy versus productivity, right? And we get so wrapped, unfortunately, during the pandemic, selling organizations, the productivity metrics actually increased because it was like out of sight, out of mind. Like, I don't know what you're doing, so I'm going to increase the productivity metrics to know what you're doing every minute of every day, right? And instead of saying, I'm going to give you some autonomy, learning from that pop-up team and then deploying it into the remainder of the organization. But what it does is a couple of things. One, It helps you get the employees to participate in their destiny of designing what their day-to-day will look like, goes a long way to get them to actually be committed, satisfied, and engaged. That's kind of one thing. So just to make sure I'm understanding, when you have a sales organization, you're trying to change their behavior, make them more customer-centric, more focused on long-term success rather than just hitting my quota today. You're saying the first thing to do is give them some flexibility away from all of your productivity metrics and see what they're doing when they're really effective and then adjust based on what you're seeing. Yeah. And it may be they're not using this tool at all, or they really want to use that tool, but they have to log in twice. So they're toggling between two different applications. And so it's wasting time. The average sellers spend 66% of their time on non-selling activities and 52% of them are going to miss quota. So we have a ton of room for improvement. And by the way, those two numbers have remained flat even during this time that CRM has gotten so advanced. So watching them allows you to see the stupid stuff you do and you force them to do day in and day out. So you can either improve the process, eliminate steps, you know, transform the way they work day to day. And that goes a long way, again, to get them committed. The second thing that it does beyond sort of getting them to participate is they now become champions into the remainder of the selling organization of using the tools because they know that they work. And so now you've just injected into these naysayers of, I'm not going to use that technology because it's going to displace my job or it's in my gut. I don't need to use tech. I've been super successful. That fixed mindset. It's a way to kind of inject that. And third, and really the most important, I think, is getting those sales ops, rev ops, right? IT, any of the metrics team, productivity teams to see that what they have put out in action. And there's like the example I gave, right? Of putting those executives into the call center. There is no way to fake that. I use undercover boss as an example, but if you've ever watched the show, how is it possible that an executive doesn't know that's what's happening? It's super possible because they're 19 layers away from that. And in a large organization, it could be 100 layers. I mean, right? You'd be way away. But they're making decisions from a report amongst the people who don't really, right? They don't agree on what a good customer experience is. They don't agree on what your top customers are. They don't agree on what is driving churn. And so they're making decisions in their own lens. 
and it doesn't actually play itself out as expected in the individual contributor layer. So that I think is the key to the kingdom, right? Is if we can help executives see the realities at those moments that matter between an employee and a customer. And specifically, if you're in a recurring revenue business, it is much cheaper for you to upsell and cross-sell to existing than go finding new. They're more willing to forgive you. They're more willing to try new products and services. You've already done the hard work of convincing them to buy from you the first time. It's a shame if you just ignore them. And there's a ton of new research out that during this time, customers are willing to consider another provider. And that is really shame on us because it's like the only time people consider another provider is when they're being ignored by another one. Or when there's a big time of change. I mean, I think that these last few years, a lot of people have been forced to reconsider their habits, right? If you can't get in the car and go to the store, you have to figure out a new way to buy your groceries, right? If you can't go into the office, you need to figure out a new way to communicate with your colleagues and your customers. And so you're forced to reconsider and you say, are these the best tools? Do I need new tools? And you're right, you do have an opportunity to sort of take off your blinders and reconsider. And that's where you really see what kind of loyalty there is and which customers say, I'm going to continue to trust the vendor I've been working with because they've never led me astray and they've taken care of me versus, you know what? Now's a good time for me to reconsider my habits. Well, when you are a provider in a recurring revenue business and you choose not to make innovation investments, for example, you don't have an app. I'm just, I'm picking on that because it's super easy. You don't have an app. It sends a couple of signals, one of which is you don't care enough about your current customers to continue to innovate and deliver to them as these habits and behaviors change what they want from someone like you. So you don't care enough to make the investment. That's one. Or two, you're just not even aware. Like (laughs) that goes back to, well, I don't know that my customers are even upset. We don't have an app because I'm not asking them or we're not looking or we're not paying attention. We've lost our line of sight to the context going back to where we started this conversation. So it's important that you also don't follow every whim of the customer because that's also not a good idea. It isn't customer is always right. And you have to chase all the mice that ideas that they put in front of you. But if you're not looking at all the ideas they're putting in front of you, you're not going to find those that have potentially have the greatest impact when you hear those the most. So if I'm going to give an example from the book, McDonald's, customers have been wanting all day breakfast for decades. McDonald's just ignored it. It's not that they didn't hear it. It's that they ignored it. And so they hit a growth stall. And so a new CEO came in and went, I have a great idea. Let's serve all day breakfast. It's like, great idea. Woo, right. He couldn't just on Friday go, we're going to do all day breakfast. And then on Monday, boom, flip the switch. It wouldn't have worked because not that everybody knows this. I didn't know this. You can't cook burger and eggs at the same temperature. So you couldn't cook them on the same grill. So you couldn't do all day breakfast until who knew until you added another grill, which meant if they were going to do, let's go back to sequence. If you're going to do all day breakfast, you have to reconfigure the kitchen. Then you can do all day breakfast. So the sequence mattered, but not listening to customers for a decade. And then it was, I want an app, McDonald's, right? I want touchless ordering. I want all those things. And thankfully, a lot of those things have been deployed pre-pandemic. So when the pandemic showed up, they were ready for, I don't have to have people coming into my establishment. So those that weren't making investments pre-pandemic really got flat-footed with they didn't have the ability to service remote, sell remote. Restaurants didn't have menus online. They weren't connected to Uber Eats or Grubhub. They had no ability, to your point, to get groceries in the hands of their customer because they didn't have any way for someone to order groceries or for you to get it to their house. And so that goes back to the behaviors were starting to shift. It was a little early. So think Netflix. That's okay. Let me find an interim step. Maybe I partner with someone, which is another chapter. I partner with someone to deliver for me until it starts to pick up. And then I can start having my own vans within a mile radius of my store. I'm making that up, but I think you get the idea, right? But if you weren't paying attention, even subscription, do I do it on a subscription service? Look, Walmart didn't have subscription. Prime had subscription. Walmart was a couple of years behind them, wanted to get things in place. And we're already doing grocery pickup and grocery delivery before anybody. So again, deep pockets, hard for a small mom and pop grocery store to compete. 
But if you can outthink them and say, I'm going to do it in a mile of my house and get loyalty, even when the Walmarts and Amazons and targets of the world are delivering or Ralph's or whatever grocery store you use, I already have an answer and I will have established a connection with my customers that is hard to disrupt. Really interesting. And it's almost like the outthinking, it goes without listening, right? Hearing what you're, like you said, it wasn't a surprise probably to anybody at McDonald's from the person on the grill all the way to the CEO that there was a movement, that there were a lot of people that believed in this idea, but it doesn't happen if you don't kind of sequence it. Make sure you understand what they want, experiment, reconfigure the kitchens. And COVID really accelerated this direct-to-consumer. I believe it really accelerated the direct-to-consumer connection. I think both on the B2B side and on the B2C side, there was this move to reach out directly to the end user and be able to reach them, which has really accelerated a lot of subscription businesses. Like you said, every retailer has said, oh, we need a subscription. We need an app that directly talks to the customer. And every manufacturer is doing the same thing, right? We're trying to build subscriptions around refrigerators and heavy equipment and equipment in operating rooms. It's just amazing how innovative and creative and and curious companies have gotten in the last two years. Yeah, but don't just do a subscription because you're looking for predictability in your revenue and forecast, right? Which is what subscription really gets you. CNN Plus, how long did that last? Not even 90 days. Five minutes? Yeah. Yeah, about five (laughs) minutes. And so- It's not that it wasn't good or bad, or was it people are fatigued over streaming possible? We see numbers changing on Netflix and other things, right? So it could just be fatigue. Could be there was no real additional value. Everyone has an opinion on why that didn't happen. But I think there's a ton of opportunity in IoT for subscription. Like you said, you know, manufacturing and equipment, literally like a new home building, like I'm going to put sensors under the sink and you're going to pay as part of your homeowner association, 99 cents a month or whatever it is. And if there's a drip, the system is going to know it, send out an alert, a plumber is going to show up before you even knew that there was a drip or a leak. I mean, there is use cases everywhere. The job to be done has remained constant and always does remain constant. And if you're not familiar with jobs to be done, also Clayton Christensen, go do a little investigation. But the job to be done is I want to invite you for dinner. It was 100 years ago, 200 years ago. I'm going to send you smoke signals. Hey, hey, come over to my shack and we're going to have dinner. I'm inviting you for dinner. Today, I send you a Slack message. I send you a text message. I send you a WhatsApp message. I send you a TikTok DM. I Whatever the job was inviting you to dinner, the solution by which I invited you is what has changed. The jobs to be done have really never changed. It's the solution. I want to be entertained. Used to be, you know, I'd go and watch a mime show, right, with little puppets, hundred years ago to now it's, I'm getting entertained with TikTok. The job to be done is entertainment. And so ultimately, if you can wrap your mind around what is the job to be done, I'm trying to accomplish. Like people want frictionless service, like the drip under their sink. They don't want it to become a big mess, but they don't want to pay for it if they don't see the value in doing it. And so subscription from a CFO perspective is the golden goose, right? That's the way we can do predictable revenue. But also in times where people are cutting back on spend, there's potential of inflation and a recession and gas prices are crazy and all of this. What's the first thing that goes? Recurring revenue charges, you know, whether it be your movie subscriptions, your music subscriptions, your gym subscription, your whatever it is, it tends to be the things that go first. So you've got to find a way that you continue to drive value for those prices that you're charging. So much to unpack there, this idea of jobs to be done. And what is your promise? You know, the promise is I'm going to help you get that job done. And that in exchange for subscription revenue, right? I'm going to help you manage your sales team in exchange for paying me on an ongoing basis. I'm going to help you get the most enjoyment out of your free time, right? Which is an important job to be done. That's where I think subscriptions do really well. And I, I'm so glad you sort of called out those CFOs who love the subscription revenue, who sort of cart before horse, tail wagging dog, say, go out, say to their product teams and their sales teams, go out and get us some subscription revenue because... It allows us to manage our cash flow better and we get a better valuation in the public markets. So get us some of that. And I think your point, which is unless you're solving a problem, unless you're handling one of those timeless jobs to be done in an ever improving way, you're not going to be able to justify recurring revenue. And it's so tempting 
to say, my customers trust me, they're paying me every month. So I'm not going to invest anymore in the product because they're just paying me. I don't have to say new and improved because they're already subscribing. So how do you get your teams to continue to innovate in an environment where the money comes in every month? So it was probably 10 years ago, if not a little longer, I was working with a drill manufacturer. So they wanted to add an IoT device to the drill and they were selling it through a retailer, right? So they didn't have D to C, it was through a channel. So it was B to B to C, if we're using the acronyms of the day. And I said, great. It was the product manager of this particular drill manufacturer who was going to launch this drill. And I said, well, what about an app? And they're like, well, why would we have an app? And I'm like, well, why would you put IoT on there? Well, we want to know how people are using the drills. And I go, great. But wouldn't it be great if the person using the drill knew about it? So for example, you've been drilling, Tiffany, as a construction worker, you've been drilling for 90 minutes nonstop. Look on your app, it buzzes you, right? The drill buzzes you. You look on your app, it gives you three wrist exercises, right? Carpal tunnel, workman's comp, all these things. Like, let's make sure the health and wellness of people using our products and services is okay. Like, that's a fun way to stay connected. Or you've been using this particular drill bit because we can tell for the last, it needs to be replaced. How about every 90 days, because you're a heavy user, we are going to send you a drill bit and then you can send us back the old one. We'll take care of the recycling, but $4.99 a month, $3.99 a month, $1.99 a month. I don't know. Pick a number. I just saw him looking at me like, yeah, we make drills. Yeah. Back to that fixed mindset. That's what we do. It couldn't see the sort of forest through the trees because it was just more about product development and about them versus how do I create this connection? Now, ultimately they made some changes. And by the way, it was not exclusively my idea. But I was really saying, like, let's play this out of where you could use it and build a subscription model and really for heavy users. Not for me. I have a drill. I pick it up once a year. Not for me. But for the heavy user, that is your primary persona. I mean, it's great you sold one and it sits in a shed. Like, you don't want to give up those. But you want that person who uses it all the time when they're after work, talking about whatever. And he goes, I love this new drill. It does all these things for me. And everybody else is going, wait, wait, what? What does your drill do? My drill doesn't do that. So I think that really sort of comes back to reimagining what you're selling and where and how subscriptions can really create a tighter connection. And if it's not just about profitability, that it is really about that experience, then you've got a shot at making it work. Yeah, that's a great example. It's really where the market's going slowly, but it's it's making its way there. And I think I think COVID's really helped the manufacturers realize that having an IoT kind of relationship with an app that helps the product user is a great way to build loyalty, engagement, as well as gathering that data on the back end. Really interesting example. One more question, and then I'm hoping that you have time for a speed round. Okay. So the last question, we've talked a lot about how you get customers to love your brand and building ongoing relationships with customers and customer centricity. And I've heard you say the fastest way to get customers to love your brand is to get employees to love their job. How do you do that? Yeah, period. There's a big period after that statement. Yes. Full stop, period. So this is something that I completely missed in Growth IQ, sort of full transparency. Like I just didn't talk about the employee at all. I might have mentioned them, but it is the next book and I'm three quarters of the way through it. It's due in 60 days. So I'm in the last home stretch of getting it done. But I will say that this was about all the things, like let's go back to the example about the call center, about the churn, about not understanding it was the credit card. Those customer service agents were taking those calls all day, every day. And oh, by the way, we did not give them the capability of updating the credit card information on the call center floor, because this was a long time ago. It was a lot about security and giving credit card information to everybody. It was a different time. We didn't have all the things in place we have now. So part of it was the process did not allow them to do that. And so that was a lot of frustration on the call center floor. And we all know, like, if you have really angry, upset customers calling your call center all the time, your call center agents are not that happy. And when your call center agents are not that happy, then they're just not that great with your customers. So there is nothing new in the statement that Robbie just shared of what I said. What is new is understanding that when you have high EX or employee experience, it creates a lift 
in your customer experience. So in your NPS scores, reduces churn rate, cut CSAT scores, all those metrics you're doing. And there had never been research that showed the correlation between those two to an actual growth rate. So two years ago, two and a half years ago, we went on this journey. We spent the last two years, three research projects and found that brands that were good on both EX and CX had a 1.8x faster growth rate than those that were not. So for a billion dollar brand, it was a $40 million impact. That research is called the experience equation with Forbes Insight and Salesforce. So then it led us down another path to say, well, that was US only, let's go global, let's do this more deeply and find out where the disconnect is between the C-suite and the employee. So we did a global study across about 3,000 employees and then about 600 C-suite. We did it in partnership with Edelman. And we also did a primary research across a retailer on improvement to employee experience where they found just focusing on giving them the tools they need, helping them be more productive, having them have the information they needed when they were servicing a customer, they increased revenue per employee for the store associate by 50%, five zero. So we knew that employee experience was the missing link between delivering greater CX and greater growth. That was what was missing. And so lo and behold, the pandemic hits, the great resignation is in front of us, and everyone's like, wow, why is everyone leaving? And the timing couldn't have been more perfect. And we're like, we can tell you why they're leaving. (laughs) Like employees haven't been happy. They're not engaged. They're not satisfied. And when it's a market of, I need a job, and they just sort of put up with it. And now with everything that's happened, that's I don't call the great resignation the great resignation anymore. I call it the great reflection that people were sort of reflecting on what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Where am I doing it? They left to say, I'm going to go somewhere else where I feel more aligned, more valued, more listened to, that they actually do things on my behalf. And I want a better employee experience. It's been fantastic to see that the employee conversation has risen to the level of being mentioned on hundreds of earning call, earnings calls in the last two quarters, which it was never mentioned sort of before that. You talk about talent and the difficulty in finding talent, but it was not about keeping talent. It's the same thing. It's retention, right? Customer retention, a lot of the same things, onboarding experiences, tracking engagement, continuing to evolve what they're getting so that they continue to grow and the job to be done of a job, right? What's the job to be done of a job? Well, certainly it helps me pay my rent, but it also gives me a sense of meaning, of contribution, of my own abilities. And if the job doesn't allow me to do that, if I have a chance to look elsewhere, I'm going to look elsewhere. So I guess what you're saying around how to improve employee experience is first prioritize it, right? Something that simple, give people the tools they need and listen to their observations. You don't have to take all of their observations, just like with customers but have a way of listening. Something that Layla Seika, also of Salesforce, once told me when I was working on my first book, The Membership Economy, she said, when you get feedback, it's not the violins, it's the whole orchestra. So you want to listen to all the different parts of the organization, your customers, your employees, your lost customers, your prospects, your people who went elsewhere. And when you hear all of that, that's when you really can make beautiful music. Absolutely. And I would say that I miss Layla, that she's not at Salesforce anymore. But I would say that you have an opportunity to, since we've been talking about churn, since we've been talking about subscription, think about the great resignation for just a moment. And what you don't want to have happen is the next great resignation is with your customers. Love that. That's what you don't want to have happen. Their great reflection. You don't want their great reflection. You want it to be great reflection, double down on this relationship, not great reflection look for something better. Right. And so the same amount of effort that was put towards customer experience, put towards employee experience. If your employees are leaving, you don't want your customers to go next. So there's a lot to be said for, and that's really the foundation for the next book, is how do you apply this thinking to, once again, growth is a thinking game. So how do you apply it going forward in your business? Love it. Okay. Let's do a speed round. Okay. Here we go. You ready? I'm ready. First subscription you ever had? Probably a gym. The path to growth that you enjoy talking about the most? I would say unconventional strategies. Now, the business is the greatest platform for change. The highest level thing. Subscription that you have recommended to someone else most recently? Huh. These are good. 
because they're making me like rattle through my brain. I don't know because I'd have to say I haven't added any subscriptions in the last two years. <laughs> yeah, I probably tried to minimize them only because I realized when I was home, I had too many. Yeah, I can't think of one that I've recommended of late. What do you do when you're on an airplane? Do you work? Do you enjoy, entertain yourself or do you sleep? I work. It's actually my best writing time. An employee culture that you have especially enjoyed being a part of? Salesforce for sure. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for being here. And I hope you'll come back when your new book comes out. We'd love to have you back. Absolutely. Hopefully first quarter of next year. That's great. I have so many nuggets and you are a pro, (laughs) as you know. So thank you. Thank you for having me. That was Tiffany Bova, global growth evangelist at Salesforce and the author of the Wall Street Journal best-selling book, Growth IQ, Get Smarter About the Choices That Will Make or Break Your Business. For more about Tiffany, go to tiffanybova.com. And for more about subscription stories, as well as a transcript of my conversation with Tiffany, go to robbykelmanbaxter.com slash podcast. Also, if you like what you heard, please go over to Apple Podcasts or Apple iTunes and leave a review. Mention Tiffany and this episode if you especially enjoyed it. Reviews are how listeners find our podcast and we appreciate each one. Thanks for your support and thanks for listening to Subscription Stories. 